I'm Lisa Martin and I'm a poet and I wrote the words for listening for what comes next. I'm a writer and I teach creative writing uh, at Athabasca and Concordia. I um, have two books of poetry. The most recent book uh, is called Believing is Not the Same as Being Saved and it came out with University of Alberta Press in 2017. And uh, I'm also uh, an essayist. I I've been writing a, a column for the Edmonton Journal for the last, I guess for about a year before COVID shut that down. I'm working on a PhD right now. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Alberta in the Department of English and Film Studies. So I come to this as a as a poet um, and the first thing I had to do was figure out um, what kind of a thing I was actually trying to achieve. So th the basic um, realization at the beginning for me was that there's a basic difference between um, one voice on a page and, um, and a choir's voices all together. So that if you take one line like like anything, any kind of line, like one voice on the page saying that, you know, I'm listening for what comes next, is really different than 24 people singing together, we are all listening for what comes next. Even if you get rid of the personal pronouns and, and bump it down just to listening for what comes next, the meaning changes based on how many voices are singing it. And as soon as there are implicitly more people involved, uh, the whole project changes. In the original lyrics that line doesn't appear nearly as much as it does in Jen's song so that was something that she sort of latched onto as the core but I did have it as the title and for me that line um, is really connected with um, kind of affective grieving of like walking out so I did a lot of walking along the top of the river valley trying to think about what's right and and thinking a lot about because it was early pandemic time, like just time itself and place and the ways that, because none of us at that time could go anywhere else, we were really here in a way that maybe we haven't ever all been really, really where we are um, before. So I was thinking about time and the experience of the different kinds of experiences of time and place and that felt like oh my goodness like I'm not Immanuel Kant over here like thinking about the conditions of perception I've got to get somewhere interesting so that idea listening is something that can be sung you know like that line listening for what comes next is something you can understand on the first read but it has a kind of emotional charge there's a sense I think in that line um, that there's something at stake you're listening very carefully because you really need to know what's coming next or you really have a stake invested in it. And so uh, for me that line is really about um, the kind of way of being in time where something has changed radically. Maybe it's the pandemic, maybe it's the loss of a loved one, maybe it's something else. But something has changed, something has intervened in what was supposed to occur, what was going to occur, what you uh, thought would occur. And now the task is instead of instead of all the other ways we might deal with that kind of um, experience to lean in a little bit to listen to tune um, because that listening listening for what comes next has a kind of hopeful posture as well it's a kind of like something is gonna come something will come I, I can't see it <laughs> I don't know what it's gonna be but I'm listening for it so that when it arrives then I can, you know, I can find it, I can grasp it, I can, um, yeah, so, so that for me, that line does that kind of work, and yet it's the kind of thing that can be sung, and sung by many voices, so I think that that's why um, Jen built the song around that line, because it, it is that kind of line that does, it can do specific emotional work while also being hospitable to that sort of, um, that requirement that it can be, that it can be sung. I, like for me as a poet, I rely on, a lot on describing um, the physical world as an anchor for abstraction. So if I want to talk about grief, I'm not just going to talk about my feelings. I'm going to find 
physical anchors in the world that can allow a reader to kind of get there by experiencing um, something, by imagining or, or thinking about something um, that, that's real. Because specificity is usually the way that poets manage to get people to get past their own sort of um, expectations or their own sentimentality or a kind of shared um, register of like this is what grief is like but to get past that to something specific you have to rely on the concrete so <laughs> um, when you're singing there isn't as much room for for that kind of specificity you can't um, you can't get away with passages of description the way that you can in prose and you can't get away with um, even um, even like physical descriptions of what something looks like are really awkward to ask people to sing. <laughs> so, um, so how do you actually get people to feel something real? What I realized eventually was that I wasn't going to be able to do it on my own and that it was going to be a true collaboration. I was truly going to be reliant completely on the music and the embodiment of the voices that were carrying the words. So once I figured that out, then I felt more room to let go of some of the things that I need for myself as a poet that I realize I don't need for myself as a lyricist because it's not all on me. It's not the whole work. It's just a kind of piece that then gets embodied. So the way that specificity embodies things in poems and description and, and that texture of language embodies things in poems, actual bodies <laughs> can do that work when it's a choir. There's something about that early pandemic moment when I was first approached by the opera to, to work on this project where everything was so shut down and so um, just quiet and a feeling of like um, you know, nothing new really occur occurring that I felt so energized by the prospect that I just thought, yes, I'll, I'll say I'll do this and then I'm sure I can find a way to figure out how to do it. You know, I, I wrote a novel while like single parenting and like, you know, juggling, <laughs> I don't know, all, all kinds of things. So I feel like if I can figure out one hard thing, I can figure out a new hard thing. And it was really hard um, to, to find language to bring to the effort to describe something um, that, that everybody has some angle on, but you can never do, you can never do justice to it in a way, um, to anyone's individual experience. And so trying to, trying to hold those things, those, the different kinds of awareness and different, um, different things together I, I found was very hard work but in ways that are um, artistically important. I really like that part of the song and I like what Jen did with it musically that's that's maybe my favorite part of the song although um, although I also really love what she did with the, the time here gone those uh, that part of the music at the, at the beginning really excites me too but I love the part about the wall in the middle so I think the line is something like um, the future is near, it appears as a blank wall, what can the wall become? And so there again, it's that work with, with things that can be sung, things that are immediately intelligible to the ear. Um, but but, but the, the metaphor, which is uh, the question that I'm responding to, what, what particular metaphor um, do you want to talk about? It's like, I just wanted to come up with something that could, that could get at the experience of having the ability to imagine the future shut down as completely as it felt like that was happening early in the pandemic. Um, and and what, what happens imaginatively when, when the future is just shut down or paused? And of course that can happen for many other reasons in a life, not just um, the kind of shared experience that we're going through right now. So, and I, and I just love the way that the music builds in that place. There's a kind of strong energy there. So it's been amazing working with Jen because she's so good, <laughs> she does. And I really thought like, I'll give her this, you know, I've got some things down on paper that I feel like we can work with together. We can take this as a starting point and we can figure out something that will work. And she just took it and she like completely honed in on something that she saw and what she did with the, the music and all the parts, all the voices, everything, especially that the way we enter the piece in the first place, like I just had, you know, in a linear way, words, one syllable words on a line that I felt 
had a kind of resonant, meaningful connection with each other. And then all of a sudden they're in like three-dimensional space in sound and the 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 first note I feel like is exactly the right note. Like it, it couldn't be any other note. And that, that's just exciting. She's just, um, yeah, so capable and so um, enthusiastic. And so, so yeah, it was really, it was a really um, cool experience and like nothing I've ever, I've ever done before. So the question of how the pandemic has affected me on a personal level is uh, a question that I feel like I could talk about at length. So to try to condense a little bit that answer, um, I think there, what's been interesting to me about this sort of moment of shared crisis is that it's shared crisis. So I've been interested in the ways that um, personal crisis or private crisis can be a very alienating experience and then shared crisis can appear to be sort of a less alienating experience, but it's still alienating for some people. And I'm really interested in the ways we could think about, culturally we could think about um, making crisis less alienating, whether it's the death of, of a loved one or a pandemic experience. What are the things that would be required of us to actually um, be together in, in a way that is um, Support, genuinely supportive, sort of dynamically responsive. Um, so those are those are the questions I think that I've really been um, thinking through and thinking about the ways that lots of the narratives around the pandemic are like, oh, this is crisis and after we can return to normal. And lots of people have talked about the ways that we might want to go forward instead of back um, at a political level, at a, you know, a level of... Um, at that sort of level, but I think I'm, I tend as a poet to come down to the personal too. Um, so what ways do we want to reinvent our relationship to crisis or rethink uh, whether we um, have maybe had a pretty lucky time if we haven't been experiencing profound crisis before this moment. So I would really like people listening to this piece um, to, to leave with the feeling that a little space has been opened up inside of whatever else is going on, um, where there's a sense of uh, sort of shared presence, even though it's, um, we're, you know, even though there isn't a sense of audience, like we're all in the room together. There's an implicit, um, there's an implicit shared audience around this piece, and I. I would love it if people felt after listening to this song that there's something in the song that that just held a kind of space for what it might actually feel like to be inside of the radical solitude of this moment. So this piece is called Listening for What Comes Next and thank you for listening and I hope you enjoy it.